So I want to one more time thank you for being here this morning. I want to thank you for coming and being part of this series where I'm having a chance to study Paul from a different way probably than any of you have studied it before. It's certainly different than I have. And that is from the perspective as a lawyer, how would I go about defending Paul? Now we've got some important classes to come, but we're still on the classes section where I'm talking about the different witnesses that I would use, at least in a modern court. The Roman courts did not use witnesses quite the same way we do, but uh, in a modern court, certainly witnesses are key. In that regard, if it's going to play, we'll play the video one more time from last week just because we worked so hard on it. So let's see if it works. In the year 57, the rabbi and apostle Paul was arrested in the temple in Jerusalem, eventually being sent to Rome. The question in this series is, what would I do if I had been hired to be his lawyer? This song introduces part six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whichever you choose. did real good with that. Can I get a witness? Um, I, I, I just really enjoy doing those things with him for, uh, I think we've got about 10 or a dozen people going to Nashville uh, at this point in time. One of the things I'm really looking forward to is interviewing Phil for about an hour uh, on, on, on the, the, in the auditorium there on campus where he'll be playing some of these. I'll play some of the PowerPoints. Uh, I hope it'll be uh, put in such a way that we can post it on the internet. And I still want to have Phil come to our class and let us show him the love. By my count, he's done about 15 of these for us at this point in time. And some of them I've got on my playlist. His My Sweet Lord rivals George Harrison's, uh, in fact, may even beat it. And so uh, if, if you've got those, I'm trying to figure out without breaking copyright laws how I can give you those copies on, on some downloadable form. But I'll worry about that on another day. Our goal in this class right now is to consider what I would be doing as far as the witnesses available to help me prove Paul's defense. One of the key witnesses we talked about last week was the witness of Barnabas. And Barnabas, in a lot of different ways, is going to be a great witness for us. But one of the keys that we have to know is that Barnabas can testify about so many different things on Paul. Barnabas was there to talk about how Paul was received in Jerusalem after Paul embraced Jesus as his Savior. Paul can, uh, Barnabas can talk about how Paul was, was not doing it for show, wasn't doing it for some ulterior motive, but truly had an inner conviction that Jesus had resurrected from the grave. And that totally rewrites not just all of history, that rewrites the present. If there really was Jesus of Nazareth crucified and resurrected bodily from the dead, 
that changes everything every one of us does. And Paul believed it. And he believed it because he experienced it. And his credibility and his reaction and, 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 and what he did is something that Barnabas would be able to testify to. So we, we, we cut off last week when the first missionary journey was taking place and Paul and Barnabas were on that journey. Now I underscored last week, but I want to bring it up again, how rare it is historically to read about a mission trip. That was not something that was done in the Greco-Roman world. That was not something that, that was done even within Judaism. Nobody went out into the world and told the world about something to persuade the world to put their religious faith, conviction, trust into a, 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 a system, a person, a God. Oh, I'm not saying that military generals and kings wouldn't use religion as a pretext to go conquer another nation. You could use it to justify military action. But, but this is something Christianity birthed historically. And it's something Paul birthed with Barnabas as they were sent to do this. So we talked about it last week. We used a map to do it. We're going to pick back up on the map today. Paul, of course, uh, 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 got his start with the church itself after his conversion in Damascus. He went down to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, he went, to, well, Barnabas went to Antioch. Paul was in Tarsus. Barnabas was working in Antioch and there were so many believers in such a need for so many new teachers that Barnabas ran over to Tarsus and said to Paul, hey, leave your home, come back to Antioch. We've got too many people who need to be taught. Now, our solution to that is, is uh, pretty nice, but it's a 21st century solution. It's called add some more seats. You know, knock out the wall over there and let's add some more seats. And we've got people in here and we teach and we share. And if we want some more or some more want to come, we got room. Or we'll make room. Back then it wasn't so easy. And back then, I mean, you can hear me. I've got a microphone. If I turn the microphone off, No, actually, I'm a lawyer. You probably still hear me. <laughs> I turned the microphone off. I bet you can still hear me. Can you hear me back there? Okay, somewhere in the midst of all of this, you, you lose the ability to teach without the modern conveniences and all the rest. And so you've got to have multiple teachers. You take six, seven hundred people in here and, and you can divide it up into classes of 30 or 40, but you're going to need 20 teachers. So they needed more, so they go get Paul. And so here Paul is in Tarsus and they decide at this point to go on the missionary trip and they start out at Cyprus. And they go to Cyprus, they land at Salamis, they walk the island all the way down to Paphos, and in the process convert the Roman proconsul, Sergius Paulius. And in the process of converting him, they leave from that island and go put into port on modern Turkey at Perga, and then walk up to Pisidian Antioch, where the proconsul's family is from. So they take the, the gospel message and they take it up there and they share it. But when they got to Pisidian Antioch, the way they did it is in part by going to a synagogue. And this is something we're going to see Paul do over and over and over. And Barnabas is going to be able to testify about this. Now, a synagogue for us is a little bit different. 
than what we experience at church. And the synagogue, as it's done in the 21st century in a Jewish synagogue, still bears a great deal of similarity to the service that's been in a synagogue for 2,000 years. But there are some differences. So what I'd like to do this morning is tell you, I think I'd have to put Barnabas on the stand and part of what I'd have to ask him, one of my subjects, one of my group of folders, Bob, would be, what, uh, uh, what is a synagogue? Explain to us how a synagogue functioned so that we can better understand what your testimony is about what Paul did at the synagogue. So John Monson sent me some pictures of an excavation that's going on in Magdala, which is up north of Jerusalem, of a synagogue. And this synagogue's in really good condition right now. And I want to thank John for sending these pictures to us. He sends his love to the class as well. So uh, 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 in the process, this is a synagogue. And the, the, the people who are in charge of the dig right now in Israel have kind of reconstructed a little bit of the synagogue in a drawing here so that we can get a better feel for it. Let me go back. You can kind of see... Uh, uh, what the, the pillars, you can kind of see the little benches, but here it is. You've got uh, an entrance hall that you walked in first, and there's a bench you can see as you're looking at the photograph on the left, a stone bench. This is a place where people could sit, they could study, they could talk, they'd have private time, they'd have greeting time. It's the entrance hall. If you went through the entrance hall into what they might call the study hall, Hall. Now we, most of us are familiar with the American school system. We have study hall. Bit different, but not too much. The room would not be called a sanctuary per se. The main meeting room. The main meeting room would not be called a, an auditorium. The main meeting room was a study hall. One of the main functions for the main reasons you went to synagogue was to learn the Torah. It was a study time. So you've got a study hall. You'll see that there at this synagogue were six columns that supported the wood beams that supported the roof. In addition to that, you'll see around the corners, uh, around the edges, stone benches that were built in for people to sit. You can also look, and back behind there, you'll see the scroll cabinet or the room that held the scrolls back behind and the, a little raised platform of the bima. Um, you'll also see in the center a table. It was a, That one was made out of chalk, but it's a big table that was used to read the scrolls on. I've got a blow-up of the table that John sent us a picture of. And they would take the scrolls, and, and the scrolls were big scrolls. And they would have a, a covering on the scrolls. And a scroll, by, by definition, it's going to have two rods, and it's going to have the, 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 the um, leather uh, wrapped around that's been sewn together in a scroll. And, and so you've got those two rods, and you've got kind of a carrying case. Most of them today look like velvet. Uh, back then, I, I, I got no clue. But, but they would take the scrolls out of the scroll cabinet. And they would bring those scrolls out. And they would lay the Torah scroll on this table. And, and from the Torah, there would be a reading. We'll talk about it more in detail in a minute. But you've got that as well. Now, the synagogue was generally located near a place of water. Because water was a very important part of the purification exercises that the various people would go through before their synagogue service. So it's generally on the outskirts of town near a place of water. In addition, the seating arrangement was something that was very important. Now this is not simply within Judaism. Roman seating as well was extremely important at Roman games, at Roman events. There were special seats for the different classes of Roman citizens. And so the, the upper crust had the good seats at the front, but among the upper crust there were divisions. 
So your, your, your elected, your, your senators, your people like that got the creme de la creme. And on and on and on. Now, here's the deal. You think, well, that's not very nice, you know. It's not very uh, open. Not, they didn't care about that. You sit in the wrong seat in Rome, it's a crime. I mean, I'm not talking like, oh, gee, we're going to write you a ticket. I'm talking about serious punishment. So they're in a society where these lines are drawn. You would think within Judaism, the lines would not be drawn so strictly because God was emphatic in the law that everyone's to be treated well. Jesus was emphatic that you take the least and you treat them the best. But that was a real upside down of the convention of the day. Within the Jewish synagogue, there were reserved seats. There were people who, this is my seat. And if you were one of the high and mighty, you got the good seats with the backs. Or wherever they might have been. Generally, the women were kept separate from the men. But this seating arrangement was one that was very rigorous and very enforced. In addition to that, you've got the scrolls closet. I've described that to you. The bema, uh, uh, the platform where the reading and the preaching would come from. And here we've got a scroll desk as well. There was a synagogue leader or a multiple synagogue leaders. Um, uh, Luke calls them, in Pisidian Antioch at least, the, the archi synagogue. It's uh, synagogue. Okay, I've just done that wrong. He calls them plural. So he's got hoi archisina gogoi, but it's a, the archisina sune go get gos would be, I guess, the singular. So this is a leader of the synagogue whose principal job it is is to make sure that someone's set up to do the readings. Someone set up to do some teaching and instruction. Someone set up to lead the prayers. Make sure it's all organized. Everybody's there. In addition to that, you've got a minister who's going to make sure that the scrolls are taken care of and they're brought out and they're put upright and people are in the right seats and nobody's out of line. And this is what the, the mechanics are. Now, within the framework of that, let's talk about the actual service. The synagogue service, the purpose of the service is to learn. We think of church oftentimes as a time of praise and worship. We sing songs in honor of the Lord. The, the synagogue service was not really a praise and worship service the way we think of it. It was a service time of instruction and teaching, and learning. There would be prayers that were said. One prayer that we know was said was the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And it, it, it is the, 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 the statement out of, of Deuteronomy that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And it goes further, but, but, but that's the Shema. That was a prayer that was very important. A good Jew would say that prayer multiple times a day anyway, but it was always being said in the synagogue. In addition to that, there were other prayers that were said, Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu, but blessed be the Lord our God, dot, 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 fill it in. These were formula prayers, sometimes said by the congregation, but often said by the prayer leader. And then the congregation would, Amen, 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 Amen to us. So be it, so be it, let it be so. Amen, Amen. There would be a reading, actually two readings from the scrolls. One is a Torah reading. The Torah is considered the law. The law is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it was read on a calendar system so that it would be read through by reading it on the Sabbath. You would read through the Torah in three years. And so there would be a Torah reading. 
And if you ever hear a, a good reader, cantor, that actually is kind of sung more than it is. It's, 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 it's pretty cool. I mean, it's like Fiddler on the Roof on steroids to hear this thing. And then in addition to a reading out of the Torah, there would be a reading out of the Navaim, the prophets. And that prophet reading, now your prophets in the Old Testament Jewish thought, you know, we think prophets, we might be thinking, oh yeah, there's Isaiah, there's Ezekiel, there's Jeremiah, and then there are all those little ones that we never really are quite so sure about. Habakkuk. Hosea, Amos. Yeah, 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 that's true. But also what we would consider Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. Those were considered prophet books as well. So there would be a reading out of the prophets and then someone in the congregation would stand up and give a lecture a sermon, if you want to Christianize it. They would give a lecture on, generally, the prophet reading. Now, you can read a lot about these synagogue services by reading the Gospels because Jesus attends them all the time. You can read about Jesus standing up and, 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 and the, the, the reading from the prophets was about the good news being preached to the poor and the blind seeing and the lame walking. And Jesus in his teaching says, today this passage is being fulfilled in your midst. So Jesus was the guest lecturer at some of these synagogue services that he went to. But there would be someone who would stand up and would speak or teach on the prophets. And then there would be a benediction at the end and a blessing on everybody and it would be over. You got it? Now, after I have Barnabas testify and explain that to everyone, I would then have him explain what happened at Pisidian Antioch when he and Paul went to the synagogue. You understand by looking the purpose, the Shema, the formula prayers, the Torah reading. They would have gone in. They would have greeted people in the entry hall or wherever. Someone's going to see them. Look, this is not a huge Champion Forest Baptist Church, 10,000 people. Did you notice the new person today? No. This is a small, compact group where when Paul and Barnabas walk in, everyone's going to want to know, who are they and what are they doing here? And Paul's got the chance to say, my name is Shaul, Saul in Hebrew, or Paulus if he's speaking Greek. Probably introduced himself by both names. And he's got a chance to say, that, you know, where are you from? What brings you here? Well, I grew up in Tarsus, but also in Jerusalem. I was a student under the Rabbi Gamaliel. What? The famous Rabbi Gamaliel, you studied under him? Absolutely, I did. In fact, I was one of the leaders of the, the, the Jewish uh, uh, movement, uh, if you will, or, or the, the temple establishment. The chief priests, I knew them personally. I used to do things for them, kill Christians, things like that. <laughs> they say, wait, and you're here? Yes. Why are you here? Oh, we've got some great news that's come out of Jerusalem. We're just walking around and telling people. Wonderful. The Archisunogoge, Gogos, Gogos would say, Hey, would you like to be the one, Mr. I studied under the most famous rabbi alive? Would you like to be the one to comment today and to teach from the prophets? Do you think Paul said, Ah, oh, no. Oh, no. Paul's like, and so we've got in Acts chapter 13 the story. Let's look at it together for a moment. We'll skip through parts of it to get to, uh, through class today. But I love this story, so I'm going to have trouble skipping. Paul and his companions, they set sail from Paphos. They came to Perga and Pamphylia. John left them, returned to Jerusalem. They went on to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day, 
they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now I could ask Barnabas, which seat did you take? Because that in itself would be insightful. Luke doesn't tell us. After the reading from the law and after the reading from the prophets, the archisunagogoi, that's all one word. It's just really hard for me to remember. I'm sorry. Um, the rulers of the synagogue said to him, Hey, and you got to know that it had already been talked about ahead of time. So this is kind of like, now's your moment. This is them saying, Hey, now's when we do it. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stands up. He motions with his hand, which is the correct way you start a speech in Greek. He motions with his hand and he says, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now the reason he says men of Israel and you who fear God is because the men of Israel, those are the Jews. Those of you who fear God is because some people who were not Jewish would still go to synagogue. They would go to synagogue and they were called God-fearers because they figured the Jewish God's probably the right God. They just weren't Jewish. Listen, the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. With uplifted arm. I love that. Because Paul's got his hand out while he says it. With uplifted arm, he pulled them out for 40 years. He put up with them in the wilderness. After destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. Now, all this took about 450 years. After that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and he gave him Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. When he removed Saul, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. So... This man's offspring, God is brought to, of this man's offspring, sorry, of the seed of David. God has brought to Israel a Savior. Yeshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. Yeshua, uh, we would say Joshua. As he promised before his coming, John proclaimed a baptism of repentance. That's a washing, a purification of repentance to all the people of Israel. As John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose I am? I'm not your Messiah that was prophesied, but behold, after me one's coming, and I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. Paul then said, Brothers, son of the family of Abraham and those among you who fear God, the God-fearers, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. Those who live in Jerusalem, their rulers, they didn't recognize him. They didn't understand the utterances of the prophets, which we read every Sabbath. They didn't understand that they were, that they were actually fulfilling the prophecies by condemning Jesus. And even though they didn't find him doing anything guilty, he wasn't guilty of anything worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they carried out all that was written, they took him down from the tree, they laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. I want to tell you something. That's not an easy religious line to sell. If you just want to sell a religion, if you're making something up because you want to start a good religion... Don't do that. Say, they killed him, and now he's a martyr. And he's in heaven. After his death, we worship and adore him because he was a good man who didn't deserve to die. In fact, we have Memorial Day for him on a regular basis. 
well, I mean, if Paul's out to sell a religion, that's much more sellable. But Paul's not selling a religion. Paul's telling them what happened. That he believes so much, he's abandoned his entire way of life for it. And I want Barnabas to be very clear about that on the stand. That Paul says God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who'd come up with him from Galilee and Jerusalem, who are now witnesses to the people. This isn't a thing where it's like, okay, he was resurrected from the dead, and nobody knows about it because he didn't show himself to anybody. you got to take my word for it. No, he shows himself, Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, i got over 500 people you can go talk to. We bring you the good news. That's why we're on this mission trip. Something no one's ever done before. You're saying, why are you here? We're not here to eat your food. We're not here to take your money. We're not here to, to get you to join a program. We're here to tell you the good news. That God has done what he promised he would do to the prophets. He fulfilled it to us, the children of our fathers, by raising Jesus. This is like it's written in the second psalm. Today you're my son. I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. He's spoken in this way. I'll give you the holy and sure blessings of David. He says in another psalm, you won't let your holy one see corruption. I mean, Paul's preaching it. He says, even David, who after he served the purpose of God, fell asleep and laid with his fathers, and his body was corrupted. How am I doing time-wise? Oh, yuck. God, look, he says, let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, through this man, Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. We're finally getting to Paul's commenting on the prophets, right? This was probably the reading from the prophets that day. And he says, so now I've put it into context. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perished, for I'm doing a work in your day, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Don't be a scoffer. Don't, in your astonishment of, oh, that's not believable, perish. Believe and be saved. That's Paul's message. As they went out, the people begged these things might be told them next Sabbath. Can you stick around for another week? After the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. Next Sabbath, the whole, almost the whole city comes out to hear this. The Jews see the crowds, they get jealous, they start to contradict Paul. They start saying, oh, this can't be right. This is, this is, blah, 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 blah. Paul and Barnabas still be, speak out boldly. But now they come down hard on the unbelieving Jews. They say, it was necessary the word of God be spoken first to you, but since you thrust it aside, you've judged yourself unworthy of eternal life. You got the choice and you just made it. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. For the Lord has said, I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. That's from Isaiah. That was the prophecy, prophet section read the next Sunday. We don't, or Sabbath, Saturday. We don't know. But with that, the Gentiles are rejoicing. Everybody's ecstatic. And that's what happens here. Now, I've got to move through this a little bit more rapidly. So here's what we're going to do. Um, after Pisidian Antioch, when they want to stone Paul, and the Jews are real upset, Paul moves on, and he goes down to Iconium. It's about a 90-mile walk. So he walks for, what is that, uh, 15 miles a day, let's say five, six days. 
So he gets down to Iconium. In Iconium, he goes to the synagogue again. He and, 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 and something really interesting happens in Iconium that I want to talk to you about in, in Lystra. In Iconium, things go real well. Hold on one second. Let me make a change here. In Iconium, things go real well. And then the people decide, no, nah, we got to stone them. The Jews get a hold of everybody that, that's not of faith, and they decide they're going to stone Paul. And so Paul leaves with Barnabas. And they go just about 15, 20 miles down the road to this town called Lystra. Lystra. Are you ready? Okay. Here's the deal. Stop. There's something very important you have to know. If I've got Barnabas on the stand, maybe a Barnabas can tell this story. I don't know. But the story's got to be told. I need to tell you the story that if you spend time reading ancient Roman literature, you might have read. Here's a picture of a fellow. I have no clue if he looked like that, but I mean, what's he going to do? Sue me? He's been dead 2,000 years. So here's a picture of a fella. This fella's name is Publius Ovidus Nasonus. We call him Ovid. Ovid wrote a series of books called the Metamorphosis. You can get a copy at your friendly neighborhood theological library to look at, but you cannot check it out. You have to read it there. The Metamorphosis is a collection of old myths that Ovid put together for people in his time. Ovid is writing this in about 7 AD. So figure this is being written 40 years before Paul. This would be for us, what was 40 years ago? It's 2017, so this would be like 1977. Some of you remember 1977. Some of you were not born in 1977. But you still listen to our music because it was that good. <laughs> I guarantee you when I was growing up, we did not listen to the music from 30, 40 years earlier. But I'm, today's Father's Day. My dad's been passed away for over a decade, but he listened to that. And so I'll say nice things. Here's the deal. This was well known at the time of Paul. This is contemporary literature and history at the time of Paul. Ovid wrote about myths. I want to tell you one of the myths he wrote about. He wrote about a story, a myth of Zeus and Hermes. Now, because Ovid is turning them into Roman myths, Latin myths, he calls Zeus Jupiter and he calls Hermes Mercury. But they're the same gods, just with the Roman names. We're in a Greek land, so we're going to use the Greek names because people where Paul was were speaking Greek. Zeus and Hermes. I found a picture of them. <laughs> the problem is that's in the wrong order, so let's call it Hermes and Zeus. And actually, I'm not sure that's that good of a picture. So let's just stick with something that's more traditional. Zeus and Hermes. Hermes famous for the wings. See, Hermes in Greek mythology and Roman mythology was the son of Zeus, the big daddy god. Okay? Hermes was the son and he was the messenger. He was the mouthpiece. He would deliver the messages. He would go tell the things and, and he was much more present. Now here's the story that Ovid tells in the Metamorphosis. Zeus and Hermes put on their human disguises and they go down and they start looking for a place to stay. And everybody ignores them. No one gives them shelter, no one gives them food until they find this old couple, Bacchus and Philemon. Bacchus and Philemon actually invite them in and give them some food in their little shanty. 
they walk us in Philemon, think something must be up because every time she pours in the wine, the pitcher doesn't empty. Zeus and Hermes liked their vino, okay? So they were not going to let that couple run out of wine. So every time they pour it, the wine just keeps flowing. And Zeus and Hermes finally reveal who they are. And they said to this couple, elderly couple, give us what your wish is, we'll grant it because of your hospitality. But we're going to curse everybody else around here who wasn't so hospitable. So the elderly couple say, we want to grow old together and we never want to be separated. So the myth goes, their house was turned into a temple for Zeus and Zeus and Hermes turned the two into Two trees that grew intertwined together. So that they became, and Ovid says, at the time of Paul, you can still see those two trees today that are intertwined. This happened up the road in Tyana. So this is the story. And people see the trees. Those two twisted, knotted trees. Those were people who paid attention to Zeus and Hermes when they came to town. Wow! Moral to that story, isn't there? Okay, why is this important? Because Tyana is right there in this region of Lystra. I mean, these are people of the, the myth. These are the people who believe it. So now let's see what happens when Paul and Barnabas go to Lystra. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who couldn't use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. Of course, everybody in this small town is going to know that. He listened to Paul speaking. Paul, looking intently at him, saw he had faith to be made well. Paul said in a loud voice, everybody hears, stand upright on your feet. And this man that everyone in that town had known all of his life and knew that he had never in his entire existence walked, sprang up and began walking. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Lycaonian, the local dialect, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. It's happening again. Barnabas they called Zeus. Paul they called Hermes because he was doing all the talking. Hermes was Zeus's mouthpiece. They figured Barnabas was Zeus because he just stood there and looked powerful. But when Paul says, get up and walk, he's speaking on behalf of Zeus. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. I mean, they want to be Bacchus and Philemon, not everybody else who got wiped out. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments. They, they, they look, they rushed out into the crowd, crying, men, why are you doing these things? Look. We're people. We're men. We're of like nature with you. We're just bringing you some good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God, a living God. The one who made the heaven, the one who made the earth, the one who made the sea, the one who made everything in them. In the past generations, he's allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he didn't leave himself without witness. He did good by giving you things. You got rain. You got fruitful seasons. You got happiness and food and gladness in your hearts. 
even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. I mean, come on. The guy healed the lame dude. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Because you got to know, word of this spreads like wildfire. Zeus and Hermes are back. They're healing people. They're doing things that can't be done. Everybody wants to come. The word is going out fast and furious. Part 8. Having pers but then the Jews, oh yeah, these are those hucksters. That's what the Jews try to sell. Yeah, they came to our town too. We figured out that they were hucksters. They're not really gods. Don't you know Zeus and Hermes are really going to get upset that you confused mortal men for them? You want to get destroyed by a couple of gods? You treat humans like they're those gods. I mean, the Jews can come in and they can sell the line. They can come in and they can tell them, hey, look, you, see, <laughs> you, you bought into this. How many days have they been here? Six? Yeah, it's day seven they want your money. These guys have tricked you. Oh, yeah, so the lame guy's walking. You know, sometimes uh, people get healed. Placebo effect. Paul gets stoned. That means they pushed him off a cliff and they threw rocks at him and he was unconscious and they turned around and walked away thinking him dead. Barnabas and the others, the believers gathered around Paul, helped him up. I'm Paul. This has happened. You know what I'm doing? I'm going home. It's time for a little rejuvenation is not just you know I, I need I look I need some healing no not Paul Paul's not doing this for Paul the disciples gathered up around him he rose up he entered the city on the next day he goes to Derby and he starts preaching the gospel there and he made many disciples and then he goes back through all of these towns where they stoned him or tried to stone him to encourage the believers to continue in the faith. Letting them know through many tribulations they would enter the kingdom of God. I want Barnabas to testify to that. He's going to be a big witness for me. So with that, here are your points for home. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. That was part of Paul's message because Paul saw that God touches hearts and people for eternity. God touches people for eternity. That includes you and me. We are his for eternity. He touches us for eternity. He calls us into a relationship with him. This was not just fanciful history. This is real. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I mean, we, sometimes we're scared to death of, of getting hurt. I mean, forget the physical. Look, physical pain keeps me from going to the dentist as often as I should. The, the point of this is, there is something so much bigger than you and me going on in this history. It's the kingdom of God. And Jesus calls us to get out of ourselves and our comfort zone and what makes us happy and put our physical health on the line, put our emotional health on the line, put our mental health on the line, put our relationships on the line, put our money on the line. He says, you bring everything you've got and you... Be willing to put it down for the mission that I'm giving you. Of course, we quickly learn many of the things he's given us. He's given us so we have them for the mission. He has armed us for the mission. The good and the bad that we have. 
He takes your good experiences in life, your bad experiences in life, and he puts them together in a way that makes you unique for the task he has for you in the mission. But the point is, we stay on mission. My goal, I got to follow God. I don't want anything in the way. Last point for home. Paul, of all people, has the credibility to me to assure me, for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good. And that's why Paul can tell the Philippians to rejoice in everything. Because you know it's going to work together for good. Even if good's not found in the slight moment you're there. Can I bless you in the name of Jesus? Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters and those who are here today and listening to this message. I ask you to bless them. Bless them with courage, conviction, strength, faith, direction. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Thank you.